Hi, welcome back to High Mileage Need Love 2. This is my 2008 Triumph Scrambler. I got this bike a little while back after riding around on a Street Triple RS for quite some time and deciding that I wanted something a little more cafe slash scrambler-esque that I can take on some ADV tours, camping trips, etc. You know, make it look pretty cool. I ended up between this and the Ducati Scrambler and after doing some research between the Scrambler and the Triumph it ultimately came down to the gearbox but more on that later. This Scrambler was the only one listed for about a five six month period of time where I was searching for another bike. There was one other one over at Brooklyn Triumph with about 70,000 miles and they were asking $5,000 for that one. This one was listed at $6,000 and with some shrewd negotiation I managed to bring the price down closer to five. The bike was completely stock when I got it and I decided that I wanted to give it a custom look and just make it stand out a little bit. So I added some features and just some stylish bits and pieces. I'm gonna go into those. If you're just looking to see what to look for when you're buying one of these, check out the timestamps in the description below and click on the one that suits your needs. When I got the bike, it needed a set of tires. So I opted for the Shinko 804-805, which are these big block tires. And what I found was that they offer amazing traction. All the reviews said the same thing, and after testing them on gravel, beach, sand, and pavement, I found that they really do give you excellent traction in the corners when you're leaning and inspire some serious confidence, which is a term I didn't really understand until I uh, rode these tires and found myself thinking that I can go a little bit lower and lean a little bit harder. I never liked the stock fender that these bikes came with that's mounted down here because it just doesn't exude that dirt bike scrambler look. So I went online and I purchased a British Customs high fender mount and installed it. Now the mount will tell you that it doesn't work with the stock fender and that you'll need to buy a shorty fender. However, it works just fine. The only modification you'll have to make is to, if you have the stock horn, you'll just push that in towards the radiator a little bit. And uh, you can fully lock the steering handlebars and you won't have any issues. What I would recommend though is actually buying the shorty fender and mounting it to the stock mounting bracket and having that two fender look just so that when you're riding in the rain or in the dirt, you're not flinging all that stuff up at yourself. The next thing I did to the bike was modify the exhaust. Now, there are several approaches you can take when changing the exhaust on these scramblers, such as the Aero 2-in-1, the Tech Desert Sled exhaust. There's a plethora of different options, and they all cost gobs of money. The best bang for your buck, however, is the Volkswagen Gia exhaust, which is just two silencers off of a old late 70s, early 80s Volkswagen Super B or Carmen Gia, I believe and uh, you just slip them on and they give the bike an amazing sound and really make it come to life. I bought these on eBay for $35 and I'll include the link in the description below if you're interested in doing this mod. From factory, these bikes come incredibly lean and as a result of that lean condition, your header pipes are gonna turn blue. This is only if you own an 06 to uh, 2008 carbureted model. Uh, if you have a fuel injected model it's not as bad however you'll still want to tune it just to get a perfect fuel uh, ratio. If you have the airbox baffle removed and you're running filter pods like what I'm doing here as well as if you're gonna do the Volkswagen Gia mod or just change the silencers to something else you'll want to upgrade the main jets. On this I have the airbox baffle removed two K&N uh, pod filters, and the Volkswagen Gia exhaust. Uh, after many, many trial and errors, I found that running a 125 main jet with a 42 pilot at one and a half turns out on the pilot screw gives me the best throttle response. 
from one, uh, one quarter to about a half. And then uh, wide open throttle, it's pretty good. However, I didn't want to change the jets again, and I'm pretty happy with the way it runs now. I also installed some exhaust wrap, titanium exhaust wrap that I got on Amazon, which I will link below to cover those blue headers because I was just not a fan. A couple of things to note that when you do this, it does insulate the heat, so your pipes are gonna feel a little bit warmer than they originally did when they were bare. They'll tell you that you'll need to take the headers off and wrap it off the bike. However, I found with a little tenacity and some patience, you can do it on the bike. When I picked up the bike, it was nighttime and the ride home, I realized immediately that lighting on these bikes is absolutely awful. So as soon as I got home, I did a ton of research as to which light to go with and found that the Cyclops light which is linked below, is the best route. However, when I went to order it, it was back ordered until too long for uh, my patience level. So I went with an Amazon H4 bulb and will eventually purchase that Cyclops once it's back in stock. If you don't upgrade the headlamp itself and you opt for just a bulb conversion, Keep in mind that this is a reflector headlamp and it will blind oncoming traffic. So what I did to kind of offset that was I wrapped the headlight with the yellow tint film, which is linked below as well, to give it that rally look, that scrambler look, as well as diminish some of that really blinding white light. Don't be fooled by this fly screen. It came with the bike and I had hopes that it would save some of the wind buffeting. However, its sole purpose is just style. And without a legitimate tall windscreen, you'll, you should be prepared for some wind buffeting at 60 miles per hour and a serious beating at anything above 70 if you're gonna be riding at that speed for extended periods of time. Uh, these mirrors, while some say they look dorky and lame, I find them wonderfully functional and they came with the bike, they're free, so I don't have to upgrade. However, maybe some bar end mirrors would probably look a little bit better. 2006, 2008 were the carbureted models. They came with a Kian CVK 36 or 38 or 40. I never really found out. There's speculation all over the place, but they're there. And if you are looking at a carbureted model, you wanna check the air box, which is behind this. It's uh, one Phillips head and you just lift up, it comes right off. You wanna check the uh, carbs, just make sure they're in good condition. Ask the previous owner if they've made any kind of modifications to the air box or the carburetors, especially if they installed a jet kit. Uh, these bikes also had the air injection system, which will have two wires coming right out of the cylinder head in addition to the spark plug cables. And uh, what that does is it just injects air into the headers uh, to something to do with emissions. And um, a lot of people remove this. So if you don't see the wires there and you see a bolt, don't freak out. It's supposed to be there. Back to the carburetors. They are synced, so mishandling these could cause them to come out of sync and, a turn, and in turn cause a very, very bad rough running condition. So just make sure you get all the details from the previous owner as to what they might have done to the bike. That way you know what you're getting into. The engine is a two-cylinder, 865cc parallel twin with 270 degree cranks that is mated to a five-speed gearbox. It makes, I believe, 51 pound-feet of torque. All of that torque is in the low range, so this bike feels a lot like a dirt bike. As far as when riding on the highway, it has decent power. However, being that it's a five-speed, just like all the other reviews mention, you are going to be searching for that sixth gear when doing speeds over 80 miles an hour. Maintenance on the bike is very basic and extremely simple. Uh, manual says to change the oil every 6,000 miles. Uh, use 10W40 in the winter and 15W50 in the summer. You have a sight glass that's right here that you can use to check the condition 
as well as the level of the oil. You want the oil to be right in the middle. Uh, you don't want it to overfill. The manual states that this bike should take four, four and a half quarts of oil. However, I found that it typically takes about four for a simple drain and refill with an oil filter. If you want the full four and a half quarts, you'll most likely have to let the bike sit overnight, maybe 24 to 48 hours to completely drain all of the oil. The oil fill cap needs a novelty sized flathead that you can find at Party City to remove and I highly recommend replacing with an aftermarket socket or hex head cap. As far as the oil filter goes, it's completely exposed and sits right behind the oil pan and should be protected with an extended bash plate if you have any intention on going off-road. At 12,000 miles and every 12,000 miles, you'll have to adjust the valves and I called a couple of Triumph dealers and the average is anywhere between $700 to $900 just for the valve adjustments. If you want the full service, it's somewhere around $1,600. These valves are shimmed, so you're not gonna take the valve cover off and just adjust the, the tension on the valves. Uh, you do have to take it off, measure, and order the shims that you need to bring the valves uh, back up to spec. Triumph gearboxes are some of the best in the industry. This thing is completely bulletproof and should never let you down unless you're a complete dope that doesn't know how to shift. Uh, generally these are extremely reliable, should never need any servicing uh, unless you ride the clutch. You might have to replace a clutch but they offer exceptionally good feedback. You'll always know which gear you're in and you won't ever have trouble finding neutral which is one of the reasons I opted for a Triumph and not a Ducati. The suspension will behave itself so long as it's on flat pavement and it encounters no kind of road obstacle. The the minute you go to hit a bump at speeds other than zero and the bike completely unladen, the front fork will quickly bottom out and the back shock will begin the early stages of resonance and until it shakes you completely off the bike. Now the remedy to this could be a thousand dollar pair of Olins or you can go with a set of Hagons which for the progressive front springs and the rear shocks shouldn't run you more than about six hundred dollars. You'll also want to update the fork oil from the current five weight to something like ten to fifteen depending on how stiff you want the front work to be but if your intention is to do any kind of off-roading whatsoever the suspension is probably one of the first things you should correct otherwise you risk bashing your unprotected oil filter that we mentioned previously and losing all oil pressure and having catastrophic failure. The Scrambler unlike the T6RC that they're based off of come with single disc brakes front and rear. The front is a dinner sized plate and the rear is a dessert size plate. They do a decent job of bringing the bike to a stop. However, the rear caliper is mounted under the swing arm, which is a pretty dumb idea. A relocation bracket sold by Triumph Twin Power, which I'll link below, can be installed to avoid bashing the caliper when off-road. touch on is the instrument cluster which is exceptionally basic. It consists of a speedometer, odometer, and a couple of lights. The speedometer and the odometer are cable actuated which runs off of the front wheel. It's uh, a couple of idiot lights. You've got useful on the right hand side. Turn signal indicators, high and low beam, and your uh, oil pressure light, which will only come on when you first start the car. Like, uh, Before I tell you a little bit more about the bike, 
I just want to let you get a sound bite of what it's like to drive around town, what the exhaust note is like with the Volkswagen Kia, and just generally the overall vibe you get when riding one of these down the street. These bikes are really great for a number of reasons, one of which is the capability to do on and off-road riding, but that's not what makes them special. These bikes are special because they do something greater than the sum of their parts, than their purpose. They warp you back in time and implore you to slow down and take everything in, to enjoy the curves of the road and to stop and consider going down that gravel path with no visible end. They will bring out a childlike kindness and curiosity from strangers because these are the bikes that they might have seen or rode when they were young, when the country was young. Samuel Hines wrote in Flights of Passage, we go back in space because we can't go back in time. And what I believe he meant by that was that we will go back to places we once grew up to rekindle the feelings and memories of our past. Perhaps we'll buy the car that our parents drove us in to revisit those memories or to give them to our children. This bike may not be the fastest or the most modern, but it's honest in what it is, an old machine in a modern world, and we should enjoy its company while it's still with us. Like we look back on the TR6C in The Great Escape we will look back on this scrambler too one day. Thanks for watching and supporting the channel. If you liked the video, please make sure to hit the like button, subscribe if you want to see more content, and feel free to check out the rest of my videos on my YouTube channel, which is linked right below.